Hi there, and a very warm welcome to Season 5, Episode 17 of People Soup. It's Ross McIntosh here. But the question is, what can we do as a team now that might make a difference, that we have a slightly better working environment moving forward? And we've, we've seen examples where teams have changed processes in terms of how work is done so that you know people have a better understanding of what they do or something's done a little bit more efficiently. We've seen examples where people have changed things like rest facilities so that actually we can focus more about being able to self-care. We've seen examples where people have changed rostering system to say, do you know what, we can, we can create a better roster so that we have better control about when we work and that therefore a better work-life balance and everyone's happier on, on the back of that. So these are examples where people have said, these are little things that we can do that make actually a difference to the work experience of everyone in this team or this department or this ward. Hey Supers, I'm delighted to bring you part two of my chat with Dr. Kevin Teo. Kevin is a senior lecturer and the program director for the MSc in organizational psychology at Birkbeck University of London. If you haven't listened to part one, I'd recommend it and you can catch it wherever you get your podcasts. Kevin is also the executive officer of the European Academy of Occupational Health Psychology. In part two of our chat, we focus on Kevin's research and his thoughts on how workplaces are designed, organized and managed, what's known as the psychosocial context or the psychosocial working conditions. And at the end of the day, what we're really trying to develop is a healthy workplace. Such is Kevin's generosity in sharing his thoughts that this whole episode is like a banquet of takeaways. To hear Kevin speak is really thought-provoking, and you'll hear him talk about his consulting approach, the workplace themes he's noticing, how organisations can sometimes see well-being as a tick-box exercise, and his simple recommendations for a step-by-step approach to organisational health. People Soup is an award-winning podcast where we share evidence-based behavioural science in a way that's practical, accessible and fun to help you glow to work a bit more often. Let's just scoot over to the news desk because reviews are in for part one of my chat with Kevin. On LinkedIn, Lewis Burton said, A great discussion, Ross. So glad to hear a discussion around the potential of using ACT to develop teams and working environments. And we had a tweet from friend of the show, Melanie LaBarry, who's currently appearing in And Juliet on Broadway. So if you're in the vicinity of the Big Apple, check it out. It's getting rave reviews. Melanie said, Favourite people talking about important things. Thank you for another cracking podcast with the inimitable Kevin Teo. And on LinkedIn, Joe Yarker said, What a brilliant interview. It's always great to hear Kevin Teo shine a light on prevention and all things working conditions at healthy workplaces. Thanks so much to everyone who listened, rated and reviewed, talked about it with a friend, recommended the podcast. With your help and spreading the message, we can reach more people with stuff that could be really useful. One other newsflash, I was invited to chat to Dr. Steve Jones on his podcast, Shit Shower and Self Care. He's a brilliant host and he talks about men's mental health with his guests. There have already been a great range of guests and I was privileged to chat about the world of work, acceptance and commitment therapy, and my experience of being a gay man in the workplace. In his podcast, he's normalising and role modelling conversations about mental health with a whole variety of men. It's such an important message, so please do check that out. But for now, get a brew on and have a listen to part two of my chat with Kevin Teo. So Kevin, I I listed off a few of your research papers from last year with your colleagues and we just spoke earlier about empowering workers and giving them a voice. Maybe that's a way into your research. Why why is that important to you? I think because we talk about as individuals what what we need. In the first part we talked about ABCs, that's basically self-determination theory autonomy, belonging, competence. And I think having that participation approach facilitates that. It gives people that autonomy, that voice. It gives people that sense of belonging. And and often through our work, we ask people about, you know, what can we do, what can you do? And it tries to facilitate that that feeling of, of competence as well. And we, we try and address basically psychosocial working conditions. So how workplaces are designed, organized and managed. And yes, you can measure that. And there are lots of really good instruments and resources around that. The Health and Safety Executive, for example, have uh, a whole suite of resources. 
but often it's the individual and the people who work in an environment who knows the environment best. And sometimes I think it's almost condescending for an external person to come in and say, these are the problems that you're having and this is the solution that you need. When it's a lot more powerful to go in and say, look, tell me about your working environment. What do you think the problems are? What do you think the challenges are? And what can we do about this? And let's try to facilitate a conversation that way. Because I think that is gonna you're gonna get a lot more people on board earlier on and therefore that yeah, gives you a good grounding and foundation to, to progress. So it's making the people the kind of architects of the solution as well as giving them a voice to explore what's going on. Very much so. So when we talk about having a more primary organizational perspective to, to managing well being in the workplace, it is it is about that to say, well actually what are you struggling with? What can we perhaps do about that? And I think the voice of the employee is so important because they know what the issues are, they know what the barriers are, they know what the resources are that, that might be needed. And, and our role is often to facilitate that conversation. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. It's When I go into an organisation, I very much take the stance of you're the expert in your job and delivering your job and being you. I'm not an expert in any of that. And I can bring my curiosity and, if it's appropriate, bring, bring the cultivation of skills to you. But, but I'm not going to tell you that the answer because that would be impudent, I would say. Exactly. And I think we, we have, with well-being being so, well, I'll say for lack of a better word, popular. You know, it's an initiative that lots of organizations are working on. And that should be commended and that should be encouraged. But on the back of that, we see lots of providers offering all sorts of things some of it really good, some of it questionable, but even things which are really good in the wrong context is not going to be appropriate. You know, a, a simple illustration that I, I say, you, you know, you, you might have a, a toolbox with a hammer and a screwdriver and a drill and they're all useful and they're all really good. But if, if you're trying to screw in a screw into a wall and you've got a hammer, that really good hammer is not going to be the answer to the solution. And, and equally, if you've been trained to use a hammer, and that's the only thing that you can do, you're going to see everything as a nail. Yeah, ain't that the truth? And the, the, there's there's people. Oh, I'll be I'll be frank. There's people jumping on the well-being bandwagon. It isn't always helpful. But as you say, there are people delivering stuff that doesn't fit with the context they're delivering it in. Yeah, and it's a very difficult environment to navigate sometimes, and particularly if you're not familiar with the literature, you're not and you just want to do something for the sake of, of, well, not for the sake of doing getting up, because that sounds quite disingenuous. And I think there are lots of organizations who really do care for their employees and, and who are willing to invest and, and, and want to, to get things right. But it's about awareness about actually what do we do about this. So that's why a lot of what we do is about trying to yeah Im- improve awareness, whether well, obviously for our students going to our programs, but also through a lot of the sessions that we do whether it's lunchtime talks or more bespoke consultancy sessions to try and increase awareness within organizations about, well, why are healthier workplaces important? Why is how work is designed, organized, organized and managed important? How do we measure that? How do we understand what that is and what can we do on the back of that, really? Absolutely. And I'm so glad you're out there spreading this message. And we mentioned that, that a lot of your work is, is related to healthcare setting. Is, is there a particular attraction? We talked about caring for the carers and your initial exploration of perhaps going down the medical route or the clinical psychology. But is there something that keeps you going back to those healthcare settings? Uh, I think we've, we've talked a lot about some of the reasons already. But also I think it's, I think it's another way you know, I talked about focusing on the world of work because it's a public health perspective, trying to prevent people from, from going off, off ill. But the outcomes from the healthcare sector is also another way of improving public health. Because if you have a healthcare system that is functioning, that is doing well, and is better able to look after the population, to look after its patients, then that's another way of trying to improve the health and well-being of, of everyone. So I guess that's another sideways segment into maybe deep down inside I'm some sort of, maybe I'm a public health person. Mm, maybe, maybe try it on. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so like I said, a lot of the stuff that, that we I've done is, is in and around the healthcare sector, although I always have to disclaim and say I've actually never directly worked in healthcare. So I don't know, Ross, if I think you might be in a similar position, but I might be wrong, so please correct me. But like I've never formally been employed as an employee in the NHS. I've worked alongside lots of really wonderful, excellent people, but therefore I cannot claim to even fully understand what it's like to be a healthcare worker here or abroad. Yeah, 
absolutely the same. I have a great affinity with our healthcare workers and the NHS for the tremendous work they do and the impact they've had on my family, for example. It's, it's personal. And if in some of my work I can support some of those people to maybe enhance their own psychological health and well-being, then I consider that some of the most important work I do. Kevin, can I ask you about themes you're noticing in the, in the workplace? I know some of your research covered the, the pandemic period. And I, personally, in my head, I still consider we're in a pandemic period. We're just in a different phase of it. I think, well, firstly, I, I agree with you that we're in, a, we're in a different phase of the pandemic as opposed to we're out of a pandemic. And, and particularly, there's this disconnect with those working in the healthcare sector versus, versus those who are not because yeah the, the experiences from what I understand from, from colleagues in the healthcare sector is that we still very much are in a, in a pandemic. In terms of themes I think what, what we're seeing is a change I think work intensification. What we're seeing I think is the same types of psychosocial working conditions but manifesting in different ways so work intensification is, is going up and I think a, a big reason for that is the, the blurring of boundaries between home and work, but also even going back into the workplace. How do we manage this return to work in, into a physical office workspace? How do we manage hybrid working? How do we manage the workloads that we had during the pandemic? And just to give you a, a simple example of that is during the pandemic, most people were, were housebound and therefore, you know, you kind of worked nine to six if, if that was what your, your hours were and, and you, you stuck to those hours then you might do a couple of speaking engagements or go and see uh, some clients. But because you're at home, these were done online. And then before and after that, you fill it, you fill it out with you know, other work duties. But now that we're returning into a, a, a more open environment, people are traveling, people are, are meeting customers, then you travel. You travel to see a customer, you travel to see a client, you travel to a speaking engagement, and then you've got to factor that time in. And that now is seen as time lost. You know, I've been to events, I've spoken to many people who say actually, you know, now I'm here, it's taken a whole day out of my work and therefore I'm sitting here physically but I'm trying to catch up on all of these emails which are coming in because people are expecting me to be available all of the time. So we haven't adjusted for the workload going back uh, when actually what we're doing is a lot of us have taken a lot more, a lot more on and it's just sort of this creep that's come in that hasn't really been picked up by many. Yeah, that, that's so interesting and it really resonates with some organisations I'm working with who are saying what worked for us during periods of lockdown and confinement, we're still doing that and it's not appropriate anymore because the context has moved on. But we get easily maybe drawn into these new habits and think they'll keep working even when the context begins to shift. And I think it goes back to something you mentioned about noticing, noticing what's going on around us. And a colleague of mine at City, Yuta Tobias Mortlock, she was actually a guest earlier on this season, talked about collective mindfulness and how that can be a great response to organizational stress. It isn't about us sitting alone and meditating. It's about us noticing what's going on around us and noticing how we are showing up as a colleague. Yeah. She calls it next generation mindfulness. And I think it's so important that we can hone those noticing skills to notice the changes in the environment or the psychosocial context. Yeah, and, and just building on that noticing, I think it's also important that we acknowledge that when we talk about the working environment or workers today, there are so many different groups of people. I think we see it most evidently when we talk about hybrid working or return to work. Some people are, just want to work from home. Some people want to work in the office. Some people want to mix to it. And how do, you, how do you balance that? But equally, we see it in other themes as well. So there's been a big emphasis about this awareness of, well, what's important to me? You know, is it, is it work? Why am I working? What's my meaning? What's my purpose? And, you know, can I change my job, change my work hours, change my working conditions on the back of that? without going to a big debate about the great resignation, but there's been lots of movement of, of people people around and some people are rethinking really about what's important to them. But equally, there are many other people. We've t we talk about the strikes and the winter of discontent, that people are struggling to get by. So many people are not in that position and don't have that privilege to say, I'm just gonna change jobs so that I can find something which better fits my values. Because actually what I need is I need to pay my food bill, I need to pay my mortgage has gone up. So how do I balance all of that? And I think what we are in danger of doing is that we talk about the workforce in general and don't pick up the nuances of the different working experience that everyone is, is going through. And it can be quite isolating if your voice is not represented. 
do, do you think organisations are getting better at considering the whole psychosocial context that they operate in and that they, in part, they create? To be perfectly honest, I don't think so. And I think we see this in the last few years with this big emphasis on well-being, where a lot of the interventions and programmes are still very much focused on the individual. An organisation might say, well, we've got well-being. We've got a well-being policy. We've got a well-being programme. We offer mindfulness. We've got an employee assistance programme. We offer free fruit on a Friday. We have subsidised gym membership. We have private health care. But actually, well-being is a lot more than that. It's about the working environment. It's not taking a step back and say, how are we as an organisation responsible? And that could be things from basic things like pay, but also how have we set up the working environment and the expectations that we have for our employees? You know, do we give them an environment that they can flourish, that they can thrive in, that they know what's expected of them, that they're feeling supported, where the workload is appropriate? And I think often the answer is is not, because there isn't really an awareness of that. The Health and Safety Executives Management Standards talks about six broad, and these are very broad components. You know, how demanding is your job? How much control you have? How supported you are in the workplace? How is change managed? How clear your role is? And what's the quality of relationships that you have? It's quite broad, but again, it's a useful marker to get someone or get a team or an organization to reflect around that. Because if you can be more aware of where you sit along these different areas, then it gives you a reason to try and change. If people are saying work's too demanding, how can we try and reduce those demands? If people are saying we haven't got much control or agency, how can we try and empower individuals? If people are saying I'm very unclear about what my roles are, how do we give that people that certainty and that clarity? Mm, that that health and safety executive framework is, is super useful. And it feels like it, I don't know, it feels from my perspective as someone in the field, it doesn't have enough visibility. There are resources there to be had for organisations and the visibility isn't always that clear. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things which is, is quite a shame, really. So the health and safety executives have got a suite of resources, but there are many other agencies as well. So the work that we've done with the European Agency for Safety and Health at Work, they've got something known as the PRIMA EF model, Psychosocial Risk Management at Work, PRIMA. Um, and that, again, has, has a slightly different model, but again, has a lot of resources on, on the back of that that can be tapped into the World Health Organization, the, the recent um, ISO standards as well, are other ways in which to try and create awareness to say, look, we need to be talking about how the workplace is designed, how is it organized, and how is it managed? Because there's no point saying to someone, you know, take better care of yourself, be more resilient, if you then drown them in work. I'll give you a, I'll give you a very simple example. You know, I, I've spoken to, to many nurses in the NHS who've said, Actually, my organization offers me, and you can insert whatever, act, mindfulness, yoga, spin classes, whatever. And how on earth am I going to find 30 minutes to go and do that when I, have got, I haven't got the time to go to the toilet? So it's about managing that, you know. If you are having a well-being offering, are you evaluating about who's taking it up? What's the beneficial impact that, that people are getting out of that? Is it hitting home with the people who need it the most? Gosh, you, you, you're so right. And it feels like we're not always meeting the people where they are. Where maybe as an organisation or as a leadership, we're playing sort of buzzword bingo by having the spin class, the fresh fruit, the here's a mindfulness app. But we're not addressing the, the real issues in the psychosocial context. And a sense I have, and I might be wrong or right, is that it can just seem a bit overwhelming to think, crikey, as an organisation, we've got to consider all these factors to look after our people and continue delivering. Yeah, it, it can be. And I think when, when, when we try and work on awareness or when we try and work with, with a team or an organisation around that, we actually talk about well-being not being a discrete intervention but being a programme. It's something that's continuous. When an organisation says we've got a well-being programme, we've got a well-being strategy and that's it, we've sorted well-being, then I'll almost say you haven't because... You know, well-being and the working environment will continually evolve and, and therefore you need to evolve uh, accordingly. But we, we take organizations through sort of a five-step process where we talk about um, preparation. So, you know, why are we here? What are the issues that you're struggling with? What have you already invested in this process? What are the resources that are available? 
Then we talk about screening, and that could be anything, a formal risk assessment to a questionnaire, focus groups, informal discussions. And I guess both, both these two first stages, preparation screening might probably fit under uh, noticing. You know, it's, it's about helping us notice what's going mm. on over here. Based on all of the information, what should we focus on? And then what should we do on, on the back of that? And maybe it could be something, maybe some organizations might start really big and say, we'll have a massive organizational restructure. Although that's probably not the first place that they would start. We would typically say, you know, what's one small issue that you have that you think that we can change that will make a, a noticeable difference? It's, it's interesting in the NHS, quite often it, one of the first places that people want to start is around um, rest facilities and, and access to food and, and to food and drink. And then we implement, we do whatever that is, and then we evaluate. And that's the crucial thing is say, well, how do we know it worked? Right? What the experience is, not just about, well, are people happier, healthier, have lower sickness, absence, but other things like, what's the uptake of it? Who took part? Who didn't take part? Who got missed out by, by this? And then we repeat. So by saying that we're going to repeat means we acknowledge, A, we're not going to get it right all the time. We will make mistakes along the way. So we learn and we improve the next time. But also by repeating, we acknowledge to say that, do you know what? We're not going to fix everything all at once. We're going to try and do one thing or a few things, a few small things, and then try and work on those. And as we work on those, eventually that might hopefully give us the momentum to work on other things as well. Hearing you d- describe it, it gives me hope that if I, if I was kind of running an organisation, I'm thinking if I had someone like Kevin working alongside me to support me in this and taking that step-by-step approach and evaluating as, as we go. It feels like such a shift from the sort of buzzword bingo that might just get this off my desk. It feels like this is deep, fundamental, authentic work and it gives me hope. Do you have that hope for organisations? I think, I think I've always described myself as a naive optimist and I think I, I need that to get through the world because you know, there are days where you go through and you work with organizations or with employees and you go, well, what's the point? And everything just looks, yeah, dark, despairing, cynical. But I think I, as a naive optimist, that's what gets me, that's what gets me through. But also, if I use the NHS as an example, again, it's not one organization. It's a massive organization with so many sub-organizations within it. And we talk about pockets of good practice and pockets of bad practice as well and it's 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 about shining a light on those areas that are doing well and trying to understand you know why why might that be be the case one of the things that we're working on right now is on a project where we're trying to collect examples of where people have tried to to change their working environments uh within a healthcare context because again it's very it's very easy to go down the route or say well our employees are struggling let's offer more mindfulness i've got no issue with mindfulness whatsoever you know i'm just using it as a, as a simple yoga act mm. whatever bring a dog to work day or something like that along that focus on the individual that has a role to play on the other approach people might say actually the secretary of state or the department of health or the prime minister or nhs england need to step in and give us more more staff more money and, and so forth and yes that is also true but the question is what can we do as a team now that might make a difference that we have a slightly better working environment moving forward and we've, we've seen examples where teams have changed processes in terms of how work is done so that you know people have a better understanding of what they do or something's done a little bit more efficiently we've seen examples where people have changed things like rest facilities so that actually we can focus more about being able to self-care when when we have got the time to look for after ourselves we've seen examples where people have changed rostering system to say do you know what we can we can create a better roster so that we have better control about when we work and are therefore a better work-life balance and everyone's happier on, on the back of that. So these are examples where people have said, these are little things that we can do that make actually a difference to the work experience of everyone in this team or this department or this ward. So you, you're collecting stories of, of what's worked, is that? Yeah. So, so that's what we're doing is we're collecting stories of, of what's work. We're still collecting stories. Mm. So I don't know when this podcast is going out, but if anyone in the NHS has got examples uh, and I've got stories to tell, then please do, do reach out. Because, and that applies even, I mean, 
for, for this project we focused on the NHS, but that applies to other contexts as well, because equally you might be working for a large university, or you might be working for a large multinational, and you might have formal HR policies or systems which might make work perhaps difficult or challenging. But at a local level, there might be things that can be done. Mm, and it, it brings us back to the, the people doing the jobs are the experts. Yeah, yeah. So working with them to arrive at the solutions. And I think it's also about being transparent and open and saying, we're not going to fix this all at once, but here's what we're doing. We're going to measure it. We'll tell you what we find when we measure it, and then we'll move on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah. Rather than doing it in secrecy and maybe not revealing when things perhaps haven't worked as well, I think it create, builds that trust and that, that hope in organisations. And I think that not, not work well is really important because we need to learn from failure. We also need to move away from, from looking at a black and white answer to say, did this intervention work, yes or no? Did we have ROI, return on investment, or did sickness absence rates go down? Hmm. Because things are not black and white. Organizations are such complex situations. And when we talk about evaluating, really what we want to understand is what worked for whom and in what circumstances. So some people will benefit, who might that be, why? Who didn't benefit and why might that be? Because it might be a tweak actually that, that you, need, you need to do. Uh, uh, you know, as a simple example, you might be running act sessions. And uh, you know, I've had feedback on, on examples like this where people say, actually it's really good, but it's not running on, on my site. It's run on the main hospital building or wherever. So I can't access it because it's not being offered to me. How do we then work that out? So it's thinking about who are we missing out who has access to it, why might something not be working, and rather than saying, actually, it's not working, let's throw it out completely, it's more about adapting what we're, what we're already doing. Or as a, as a different one, we talk about, we can have a, lot, we can have a whole discussion around policies. Um, I do think it's important that an organization has policies to identify you know, what problems might be and what the solutions might be. And, and I did some work, um, some training, and, and there was a, a senior director from an NHS lab, and he said, I run, this whole lab manage it and I've got no idea what my responsibilities are what we do when someone says you know I'm being signed off with stress or, or, or etc so he says this is a takeaway we're going to write a stress policy I said fantastic two weeks later he emails me and says dear Kevin spoke to HR we have a stress policy so in that situation the case is well we're not going to reinvent the wheel and write one but actually we're going to reflect on why is it the case that your senior leaders in your organizations are not aware of what policies exist and don't exist. So it's about tweaking what we're doing as opposed to trying to do something brand new. It, it so resonates with me hearing you talk. It's such a treat because, yeah, quite often as the policy maker, we can focus all the effort and energy and attention in developing this policy. And we might, if we're doing our policy development in a great way, we'll go and consult with people and, and get input. And then we can be so, like, either exhausted or chuffed when we finished it, we don't... We don't put the same energy into saying, hey, we've got this policy. Yeah. So I, I do believe it's those tweaks. That's so interesting. And I think it's powerful in terms of two ways. One, it shows that when we talk about, because I talk a lot about organizational primary interventions, and people think mm. I'm talking about big restructurers and stuff like that. In some situations, maybe, if you have the resources. But also small things can go a long way in, in making a change. To, you know, to, to let people feel like they're being listened to, that they're being, that they're being heard. But equally, and that goes back to that, that noticing stage, when we talk about preparing or screening for intervention, the question is, what are we already doing? And is it working or is it not working? Lots of organizations are investing lots of resources in health and well-being. How do you know it's working? Mm. I think it's that preparedness to sit with that discomfort of holding a mirror to yourself as an organization and saying, come on, let's have a look on what is it working and what isn't working, rather than saying, da-da, everyone's got a mindfulness app. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. And, and even other things, you might be able to look and say, the whole organization has access to a mindfulness app, or other apps exist as well. But what's the usage of it? What's the uptake um, of yeah. that as well? So that's something to, to reflect upon, because otherwise, if you're only doing things in, as an organization, we've all come across this in organizations, say, look, here's 10 pages of stuff that we're doing for our staff well-being and the question is how do you know it's working are you evaluating any of that and they go i don't know and then then what why are you doing it you, you're taking me way back probably whew, 
20 odd years, I worked in the civil service and I was in a team that was managing the contract with the employee assistance program. They provided us with data on who'd accessed it from which broad work area. It was a big government department. And the usage stats were pitiful. And one set of people interpreted that as great. Our people don't need the support. Whereas I got a bit of a gob on and saying, well, why aren't people using it? Perhaps they don't know about it. Or perhaps they feel some sort of stigma in approaching it, even though it's all anonymous, approaching it and using it. Perhaps they feel that someone might find out or and it might reflect on them. And I went on a bit of a mini campaign talking about it and, and seeing if anyone would be willing to talk about how they'd access the service and what they'd found useful about it. And, it. and it helped a little bit, but I think people can still feel that stigma and that they're completely blind to it. But it can give an organisation that comfort of, hey, we've got an employee assistance programme, I've kind of outsourced my anxiety on that. Yeah, and I think it's, it's almost saying that as an organisation, have we... That's a very defensive position that, that, protected, that protected space. Uh, we've got my, my barriers in place. And it's almost, as an organisation, have we got a stress or wellbeing policy? Have we got mental health first aid? Have we got access to employee assistance program, occupational health, something like that? And they can say, look, we've got those three. This is the basic that we need. We've ticked the boxes. And if you're saying that that is your wellbeing approach, then actually that's not the case. And I think wellbeing actually is about how well the organisation is run. And I'll even challenge organizations to say, look, if you are spending five-figure sums, six-figure sums on an app or access to an employee assistance program, and if your usage statistics are very low, my challenge would then be, is it worth cancelling that contract if your staff are talking about workload issues and hiring more staff? Might that perhaps be, and again, it varies from context to context. Some situations, the answer would be no. But in some situations, the staff will probably be better off having an extra colleague as opposed to having access to an app. Gosh, it's complex. It's complex, (laughs) but also simple. Yeah, and I'm grateful for your naive optimism as well that keeps you going. How, How do you disconnect from work, Kevin? How do I disconnect from work? Well, I... I, think, I imagine with a three-year-old, yeah, there's, a, th- there's a ready-made source of disconnection there. That, that, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. So, yeah, with, with a three-year-old, I, I think that, that's helped. So, I mean, on a, on a more personal level, I do try and keep weekends off completely. And, and that is family time to try and try and balance on that. But I also have to hold my hand up and say it's something that also I need to make sure that I disconnect. Um, it was sort of halfway on one of the ways, maybe the second or the third wave of the or third lockdown that we were in where, where my wife forwards me an email that she got from her organization about staff well-being and she kind of forwarded it on to me and says, I know you're the expert on this, but you might want to have a look at this. And it was the email header was, you know, looking after your work-life balance. <laughs> so I was a bit like, touche. <laughs> um, but I think it's, it's about, yeah, well, talking a lot about, it's about noticing and actually and being, being mindful. And I think it's going back to the song that I shared, The Nights. You know, when I look back at the end of my life, what is it that I want to be remembered for? Yeah, it works a big part of who I am, but also I've got other responsibilities and interests as well. And um, whether that is my family, scouts, I do enjoy other things as well, sports. So I'm um, trying to find time for all of that too. Being purposeful, mm. being mindful, being present. Now, Kevin, I wonder if you have a takeaway for the pea soup. Is anything for them to, to reflect on? I think one of the main, I'll well, say two takeaways really. One is recognizing that we're the product of, of our environment. So staff well-being, but also productivity and whether that is um, patient care, share prices, how many widgets that's being made is all reliant on the work environment. So we need to create better and healthier working conditions for, for everybody. And we can start simple, as I said, work on something, recognize that it's a process, we will make mistakes, and the next iteration, just try and do a little bit better than, than what you did, did the first time. And I suppose one question to reflect on that I often invite teams to reflect on is to say, look, as a team, if there's one thing across the next month that we could change, what might that be? And if you want to think about that from an individual perspective as well, you could think about that, you know, as an individual, me, if there's one thing that I could change in relation to my work over the next month that will make work better for me, what would that be? Beautiful. I think that's really powerful. And like you say, it's, 
it's simple yet it's tough but I love I love the framing of that that we can really just reflect on one difference we can make either at the team level or the individual level start small but start is basically what I would say yeah I love that Kevin thanks so much for joining me on People Soup it's been a truly thought-provoking insightful engaging chat you've really fed my inner geek so thank you so much for coming on the show well thank you ross for the invite thank you p supers for hanging until the very end and um, if anyone i guess has any questions or comments i'm always open for people to to reach out and if people have stories from the nhs or elsewhere about what's worked in in terms of changes then your your email box is open yes please do please do reach out p supers that's it part two in the bag. Thanks so much to Kevin. I'm so grateful for his generosity, reflections and his wisdom. We love to get your reviews, so let us know what you think on the socials or drop me an email or even a voice note on WhatsApp. You can find the show notes on our Captivate site, our new platform, which is peoplesoup.captivate.fm or via my website at rossmackintosh.co.uk. If you like this episode of the podcast, please could you do three things. Number one, share it with one other person. Number two, subscribe to the podcast and give us a five-star review, whatever platform you're on, and particularly if you're on Apple Podcasts. The Apple charts are really important in the podcast industry. And number three, share the heck out of it on the socials. This will all help us reach more people with stuff that could be useful. I love to hear from you, and you can get in touch at peoplesoup.pod at gmail.com. On Twitter, we are at peoplesouppod on Instagram at people.soup and on Facebook we are at People Soup Pod. Thanks to Andy Glenn for his spoon magic and Alex Engelberg for his vocals. Most of all, dear listener, thanks to you. Look after yourselves, peace supers, and bye for now. I did my MSc at Nottingham, as I said, and I took three years out doing the various placements and stuff and just getting work experience. So I was three years out and everyone else was pretty much fresh off their undergrads and they call me Grandpa on my program. <laughs> oh, burn. Um, and where else, if I'd gone to Birkbeck, I would be one of the youngest. You'd be whippersnapper if, if, I, if I go to Birkbeck now as a student on, on my MSc program, I would still be, I think, below the average age. <laughs> yeah, you would be one of the, the kids, the cool kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the kids, but I don't know if cool is necessarily the right oh.